Our next speaker will be George Gilder. Thank you, Art. Um, life after Google. Uh, there will be life after Google, although the interesting fact is that Google really doesn't believe there will be life after Google. The problem with, uh, this is the Google philosophy, is what I call Silicon Valley Marxism. And that uh, the Silicon Valley people make the very same error that Karl Marx made when he assumed that uh, uh, human quest for productivity and, and wealth had really ended with the Industrial Revolution, and that in the future, um, all politics would revolve around the distribution of wealth rather than the creation of it. They believed that the Industrial Revolution was kind of an eschaton, a final thing. And uh, this is really the fundamental flaw of Marxism. It uh, denies the endless creativity of human beings. Uh, Google Marxism is almost the same. It uh, uh, believes that it's artificial intelligence, it's search engines, it's biotech, it's self-driving cars, it's robotics, are all a kind of final thing. As a matter of fact, not only will it uh, obsolete human labor, but even obsolete human minds. And, uh, and so that uh, in the future, uh, machines will beget machines in a cascade of uh, uh, ever-growing intelligence out into the universe and uh, we'll be left behind on beaches to collect a uh, guaranteed in annual income while Elon Musk and uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin fly off to nearby planets in a winner-take-all universe. So that's uh, the essence of uh, Google's belief in the future. This is the really successful version of uh, Life After Google. I learned yesterday that it won a prize in China as the best social science book of the year. And they've just published an edition of Wealth and Poverty in China that's quite a beautiful design of wealth and poverty. Um, so to China is not all that it seems from the distance or in the, through the prisms of uh, the media, it's, or even conservative theory. Uh, Ch China is just a mass of contradictions. It's, it's more capitalist than we are. It has uh, much more, uh, it has three times as many initial public offerings. It has more business starts. It has uh, a smaller government as a share of GDP, uh, uh, only about 20% of, uh, of uh, ch China's GDP is government compared to close to 40% of ours. Uh, this is because the private companies in China have grown so spectacularly faster than uh, state-owned enterprises have grown. Uh, this is my, uh, I always, this was my contribution to the iPhone because uh, uh, Steve Jobs did uh, pass around life after television in the early 1990s. And uh, the computer of the future would be as portable as your watch, as personal as your wallet. It would recognize speech. It would recognize Jay Richards. It would, <laughs> it would collect your news and your mail and uh, might not do windows, but open doors to the future. Anyway, um, but in order to understand the, my full argument today, uh, I want to lead you through a quick 
version of my information theory of economics that I've been working on for 15 years probably now. And uh, the key proposition in it is that wealth is knowledge. And uh, I like to quote Thomas Sowell on this theory. Uh, Thomas Sowell said, the Neanderthal in his cave had all the physical resources we have today. And as I add, the difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely the accumulation of knowledge. A uh, professor at MIT, Cesar Hidalgo, made a related observation last year in his book on information. He said, when a expensive car crashes into a wall, all the value disappears, even though every molecule and atom remains. The wealth is knowledge. The car is information. And uh, this is really a fundamental proposition, that capitalism succeeds because it's, it, uh, every business is the entrepreneurial test of uh, hypothesis. It proceeds through science, uh, sci the scientific method to expand knowledge. So if wealth is knowledge, what is economic growth? Learning. And for decades, I've been engaged in studying the phenomenon of the learning curve. Uh, Jay was talking about learning curves earlier today. With every, it was the foundation of a whole uh, business consulting uh, success in Boston with the Boston Consulting Group and Bain and Company. It probably the first uh, studies came from the Navy. With every doubling of total units sold, uh, costs drop between 20 and 30 percent per unit. That's the learning curve. And uh, Bain and Company and Boston Consulting Group have shown learning curves everywhere across the economy, from poultry, eggs, to software lines of software code, to transistors on a chip, to um, oil wells, to you name it, uh, uh, the insurance policies. It's uh, the learning curve can be documented. And that's not a coincidence that learning curves are the most ubiquitous ph phenomenon in, ca in, in capitalism. It's true because economic growth is learning. That's what it is. And uh, Moore's Law is a learning curve. If you really, uh, the reason it seems to be different, as Jay said, is that uh, uh, you can, the number of transistors on a chip multiplied at such a fantastic speed. But if you really scrutinize it closely, you discover that Moore's law is a learning curve. All Kurzweil's law of accelerating returns. I try to tell him this, but he won't listen. Uh, but uh, the law of accelerating returns is not something that applies particularly to information technologies or computers and calculators or whatever. The law of accelerating returns, which um, Kurzweil purports to have coined, was actually uh, the final chapter of Henry Adams' book, uh, The Education of Henry Adams. And he showed that the law of accelerating returns, which is essentially more learning curves, applied to energy production throughout the 17th and 18th century as the same bunch of curves that Kurzweil deploys for information technology today. I'm not sure that things really are accelerating today. This, this future shock assumption, I think, is probably spurious. 
I think the living through the Industrial Revolution was probably a much more convulsive uh, experience than uh, living through the age of the iPhone. But that, that's, uh, uh, I think that uh, it's more fundamental growth is learning. And if, and this is the more uh, contentious one, but I think is probably most important. Money is time. And, uh, you know, I've just come from Freedom Fest. I recommend it. It's a great place where all the battles that you guys conduct get uh, propagated all across uh, many floors of the Paris Hotel in uh, Vegas. But um, I think the misunderstanding of money is a profound problem on all sides of the political spectrum. Uh, Steve Moore and Herman Cain, both great figures. I've, I admire both of them great, uh, greatly, and I want them to be on the Fed. Uh, but they had a panel about what they would do if uh, they had been named to the Fed. And both of them talked about basing money on commodities, tying it, uh, uh, um, Moore wanted to tie it to a basket of commodities. And, uh, and uh, Cain proposed a petrodollar. It should be tied to oil. And, and all these ideas fail to understand that money is a measuring stick. That's what it is. It's, it uh, measures value, and it's not, it's not uh, and a measuring stick cannot be part of what it measures. And, uh, and, to, ha and uh, to have money, um, money based on a basket of commodities that are priced in money is just a circular um, a circularity that uh, doesn't actually produce any more stability than the existing system. Nobody understands why gold worked, and gold is the only of a money that really has worked. Anyway, I'll, get, I'll be coming back to money. Uh, the other p point about uh, money and time as a measuring stick is you study all the other measuring sticks at Système International in Paris, and you get the kilogram, the meter, the second, the uh, mole, the uh, degree Kelvin, uh, the ampere, all these. And uh, if you actually drill down deeply, all of them have a, have a frequency involved in the definition of the measuring stick, of the, the physical constant that, uh, that anchors the, all these other crucial metrics. And time is really what remains scarce when everything else grows abundant. And, and it is thus the most crucial scarcity in economics involved in every economic activity and decision. And uh, what money does is translate this fundamental scarcity of the universe into uh, economic transactions fungibly across the economy. That's, that's what it, it does. So money is time. Well, this is the other principle, that high entropy enterprise full of surprises, information as surprise, uh, requires a low entropy a low entropy carriers, a low entropy uh, stable and predictable. And that's the, the crucial principle. So uh, when I discuss uh, Google and life after Google, what I'm really addressing is that system of the world that Google expounds, and uh, which I opened by describing the Google Marxism. And I think uh, every uh, 
technological era really expresses a system of the world. And Juan Fenn, I believe that uh, fate now has made the U.S. and China as unwilling but nonetheless inevitable collaborators in the launching of the new system of the world. Now, Google's system is big data, cloud computing, machine minds, and uh, all their goods and services given away for free. It's an aggregate and advertise model, and they think giving things away for free is somehow virtuous, and that's a crucial point of their system of the world. In March 24, 2009, uh, Zhou Chuan, the great central banker of China, uh, gave a speech in response to the financial crisis of of uh, the 2008, and uh, his speech to the World Bank uh, uh, called for end of freely floating currencies and a new global money founded on gold, and uh, repeating Keynes's proposal at Bretton Woods for a gold-based bank core, and uh, this was a response to the financial crisis of 2008, which was uh, a fundamental, fundamental result of a worldwide rebellion against time by central banks. Satoshi Nakamoto, almost at the same time as uh, the Chinese central banker, um, launched the Bitcoin program. And he uh, declared Bitcoin as an alternative to the culture of currency manipulation which produced the financial crisis of 2008. So both the Chinese and Satoshi really were both responding to the same event with, this, with a call for a new form of stable money. And uh, who Satoshi is, is not altogether clear, uh, but uh, Craig Wright ha is probably a central figure in the creation of Bitcoin, although he's very, he's something of a rascal uh, in and out of jail in Australia, and, but, uh, and so nobody wants him to be Satoshi, but his partner died, and the partner's family immediately sued Craig Wright to get his uh, billions. Uh, his partner believed he was Satoshi as uh, a software coder. And uh, any any case, and uh, Vitalik Buterin is another key figure in the rise of this movement to produce a new stable currency. He uh, is really, I think, the most amazing entrepreneur of our era. Uh, he was lured out of college by Peter Thiel's fellowship. You know, Peter Thiel gives $100,000 to people to leave college to start a company on the grounds that uh, the colleges today are resemble the uh, a uh, Catholic Church of the 16th century, uh, giving out indulgences and uh, and and the form of diplomas uh, to save the souls of their petitioners. Or, any case, um, uh, but Vitalik came out of uh, Waterloo University, started Bitcoin Magazine, went around the world. Uh, arrived in Israel, discovered an enormous center of uh, creativity in Israel where they proposed using blockchains not merely for um, uh, money, but also for con smart contracts. 
and he created uh, the Ethereum blockchain to compete with the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, he combined it with the with launch of a new currency called Ether, based on uh, gas, uh, was, is, was the foundation of the value of Ether. I think there he made the commodity mistake because gas was the energy cost of uh, the currency in, through the mining system. And and he in, uh, developed a new software language called Solidity to uh, implement these smart contracts uh, which uh, could be embodied in software and uh, actually uh, create a autonomous uh, corporations. Uh, uh, his model of a uh, smart contract is a vending machine. You stick in your money and uh, the vending machine enacts an algorithm and delivers you your Pepsi. And uh, that is the... Um, but, uh, but Ethereum smart contracts were a tremendous force. Uh, they address the great problem, I think, of the U.S. economy in recent years, one of the great problems beyond that scandal of money, and that is the collapse of IPOs. Uh, there's 90% fewer IPOs than there were 20 years ago. And the IPOs we do have are mostly of unicorns, that is, these billion, billion market cap companies that have already realized most of their valuation before they, and potential before they go public. Uh, the public companies of the 1990s um, came public at a valuation, a small portion, you know, then the tens to scores of millions of dollars rather than billions of dollars. And, uh, and thus allowed the public shareholders to actually experience the upside of these companies' development after their IPOs. So in any case, there was a 90% drop of IPOs, a 50% shrinkage of the stock markets in terms of total public companies, about 50% fewer than before. So when you see the stock market boom, you got to understand that it's uh, a steadily shrinking number of public companies involved in it and less competition from new public companies. And, and it's uh, a, a crucial problem in the U.S. economy, probably largely inflicted by Sarbanes-Oxley and a lot of other laws that uh, make it so treacherous and difficult to be a public company that um, many shrink from the prospect. T and uh, t so, uh, but Ethereum, uh, its most successful kind of smart contract was called an ERC-20 token. And that was essentially an IPO. It was an ICO, an initial coin offering. And there were several thousand of these initial coin offerings in one year that uh, raised some $25 billion for these startups, which uh, many of which were virtually scams. 46% uh, uh, went bust uh, rather quickly, which is uh, uh, comparable to the experience of the dot-com uh, blowout. But, uh, but still, uh, the uh, thousands of, co of formidable companies embodying this new black block blockchain technology were launched on the Ethereum blockchain and raised some $25 billion in 12 months uh, last year. And that, is, uh, that was a demonstration that this technology is not inconsequential. It, it is, it is a truly important new force. 
Bitmain was, uh, by several accounts, the most profitable semiconductor company in the world last year. It was started by a bunch of Chinese kids who in, 19, in 2012 identified Bitcoin mining as the most uh, lucrative opportunity in microchips, and they designed uh, an ASIC that uh, could perform mining faster than any uh, computer. Mining is the way uh, Bitcoin and other blockchains uh, validate, uh, uh, um, verify the blocks, var validate their observance of a whole series of conditions, and, uh, and then uh, incorporate them into the blockchain. And, and the mining chip that uh, the Bitmain people designed in 2012 um, did terahashes a second. It's an application-specific integrated circuit. And uh, it's not a general purpose computer, but it is uh, still the fastest uh, device in the history of the world. And uh, they've steadily advanced its capabilities up to petahashes a second. This is uh, um, SHA-256 uh, encryption. Um, uh, computations done in a single chip, uh, peta, uh, peta hashes 10 to the 15th of a second. And um, Bitmain was uh, probably the most profitable semiconductor company in the world last year. So uh, this uh, Cryptocosm launched by Satoshi was, is, uh, is, I think, the most important recent development in the world economy. And the reason I think it's the most important is because it addresses the two key crises in the world economy, the two key failed paradigms in the world economy. And the, the two failed paradigms are, one, internet security. You can tell a failed paradigm because the more money you spend on it, the worse the outcome. And uh, internet security, we spend more and more money on internet security every year. It goes up 20, 20 to 30 percent a year, expenditures on internet security. And last year was the worst year ever, a billion breaches last year. So this is a catastrophe, and it sows paranoia everywhere. You know, everybody thinks that Huawei, you know, this Huawei crisis, as it's described, somehow um, is uh, something to do with machinations of Chinese intelligence, or, but it's really expresses the fear everybody has about all equipment across the internet because it's hacked continuously. It doesn't matter whether it's from Huawei or Siemens or uh, Cisco, uh, the technology gets constantly hacked. So, so the idea that somehow Huawei, if we banish Huawei, we somehow can banish the hackers from the internet is a complete delusion. Uh, the, it's a billion hacks la last year, essentially, and uh, everything gets hacked from the government personnel office to, to the RSA company. It, it doesn't matter. So, so what we have here is not a problem of security, we have a problem of architecture, of internet architecture. And what the blockchain does is offer a new internet architecture that can uh, uh, integrate security into the system itself. So that's, that's one uh, contribution that uh, the blockchain technology can accomplish. 
The other contribution is the scandal of money. Uh, uh, $5.1 trillion a day of currency trading at 70 times all world trade in goods and services uh, is a failed paradigm. It doesn't stop currency wars, trade conflicts, zero-sum mercantilism. Uh, uh, it's, it's a complete failure. And uh, you go to Google and they think uh, mining that uh, Bitcoin mining is a tremendous waste. Well, what about $5.1 trillion a year of currency trading that accomplishes nothing except to allow central banks to deny time and steal from the future, steal from our kids and grandchildren in order to pay off political cronies today? Arts had heroic campaigns for years on this subject, and uh, I think, uh, but that is what currency trading is about. Floating currencies don't work. Just as we don't float the second, the meter, the kilogram, the degree Kelvin, we sh uh, shouldn't float money. Money is a real thing. It's a measuring stick, and its root is in the fundamental scarcity in all economic activity, which is the passage of time. But uh, systems of the world, uh, in, as crucial to understand, can change overnight. Um, in 2008, the world's four top companies in market cap were Exxon, Walmart, uh, China Petroleum, and the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. Those were the first top companies and 10 years ago. Uh, this year, the top four companies are Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Apple at various. Now, uh, this, this transformation over 10 years has arouses indignation in the United States, apparently. We think that, uh, that uh, China has somehow been exploiting and stealing from our companies uh, with, by uh, manufacturing their uh, goods, their key products in uh, China at uh, margins around uh, 5%, while these companies get 50, 60 percent margins and uh, are the dominant companies in the world in market cap. Clearly, this ascent of China did not come at the cost of these four companies, at least. So uh, how did this happen, this uh, transformation? In an information age, Economies can change as fast as minds can change. And that's, uh, and, uh, that's how you, you had that uh, transformation. So in 2023, will the top four be Google-inspired, perhaps moving to China, uh, having the biggest economy and the biggest market, and uh, with uh, US companies uh, uh, not contesting it. The, uh, these four companies have different systems of the world than uh, Google does and different business strategies. While well, Google, Facebook, and, and uh, uh, our social networking firms depend on advertising, give away their goods and services for free in exchange for advertising. Uh, not, they get 95% of their revenues from ads. Uh, the Chinese imitators of these companies all have ingenious ways of collecting money from actual customers and get only about 10% of their revenues from advertising. And um, my view is that the free, um, 
strategy, giving away your products for free in exchange for, da for data from your customers, uh, and uh, translated into advertising dollars is going to be a failed uh, strategy. And uh, Tencent is an amazing company to study. Uh, Tencent, uh, while uh, we all ruminate on whether uh, it's a big power grab for Facebook to try to launch Libra, their, their cryptocurrency, uh, that uh, this is an abuse of their monopoly. Tencent, since it launched its wallet a couple years ago, three, three or four years ago, I guess by now, has uh, conducted $10 trillion of transactions through its wallet. And uh, between Alibaba and Tencent and their Alipay and uh, WeChat, uh, um, banking, uh, cash is largely banished from, uh, and credit cards largely banished from uh, China. And uh, I believe that this, and ByteDance is, uh, is an Instagram imitator that, uh, has, that it's now moving into the United States and is really exceeding Instagram and its growth rates around the world. I mean, this, the idea that, that Google, Facebook, et al. are monopolies that have some imperial superiority that can never be challenged is, is really just totally uh, parochial. I mean, if you go around the world, you understand that these country, companies are under dire uh, competitive pressure. And, uh, and, and to, for the U.S. to try to break them up while uh, uh, Tencent gains this incredible, incredible facility and intuitive capacity through their WeChat uh, social network that also does banking and transactions and, and uh, all kinds of other s services. While, uh, while these companies integrate all these uh, functions in incredibly infectious uh, and intriguing ways, uh, the U.S. Uh, wants to bring antitrust proceedings against these com companies to break them up. It's really quite um, um, peculiar from my point of view. Uh, the most peculiar thing is, you know, it's not legal for Google to hire the best computer scientists anymore. Uh, Google is being sued by the Trump administration for sex discrimination. Uh, they don't uh, hire enough female software coders, and uh, it just, uh, it, it's really, as Google points out, they hire a higher proportion of females coders than anybody else does, essentially, but uh, uh, many more than the proportion of females in computer science courses across the country. But still, the EEOC can sue Google for sex discrimination. Anyway, that's... Um, this is how fast this uh, uh, Chinese growth has occurred. Shenzhen is... Uh, is the, big, is the industrial center of the world. It's where most of the iPhones and, and, uh, are made and other Apple products and Foxconn's there, Huawei's there. And uh, in 2007, it was, you know, an expanding, growing uh, company. By 2012, they'd erected their big sports complex and by 2017, they've had uh, skyscrapers across the sky and uh, 14 million people. It's, uh, it's just awesome to see the building of the cities of, of China. There are 100 cities in China with more than a million people now, and they're... Uh, it, the, 
uh, it just seems to me that uh, this, this, gr this growth is kind of a testament to the paralysis that's uh, happened in the United States and that you people are constantly fighting against, and which is really, uh, uh, you know, it's really a green problem that we can't do this. I mean, we, do, we couldn't dream of building a city that fast uh, because of uh, the lawyers would uh, stop it. And uh, I think th your campaigns are just eminently valuable and they really do strike at the very heart of our manufacturing problem. Our manufacturing problem has nothing to do with China. It has to do with us. And uh, I think that uh, um, uh, winning this battle, as we are in the Trump administration, and uh, as I hope we can continue to do in the future, uh, will be uh, an important uh, goal. I think it's, uh, is that good, Jeremy? Uh, have I talked long enough? Well, I mean, I could go through a... a Why don't I answer questions? I mean, I can go through all the Google and cryptocosm laws, but I think, I think we can leave them out. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in your uh, statement that these uh, certain companies like Exxon and Walmart used to be top of the pile for market cap and now it's all these cyber companies when in fact the United Nations principle for responsible investment has made a mandate for all the institutional investors to invest in clean tech and sustainable tech. Yeah. So all of these cyber companies have gotten the attention of these uh, institutional investors holding a hundred trillion dollars in assets and they've all invested heavily into Google and Facebook and all these other clean tech companies, which presumably don't have a carbon footprint. And to make sure they don't have one, they're invested in 100% renewable energy, a lot of them. Yeah. Well, isn't so it it's not because they're, uh, Denise they're O'Leary or whatever her name was, who was head of the EPA under, under uh, Obama. Is that Denise? Is that her name? Denise O'Leary? Somehow that's a name that sticks with me. Anyway, she, Fast Company um, named her one of the most creative business leaders of the world um, uh, in the current issue uh, because she reduced Apple. She joined Apple and, jo and reduced Apple's carbon footprint to zero. And she did it by incredible creative ideas, uh, chiefly investing in mango farms in Latin America. Buying offsets, yeah. Anyway. But, 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 but a very good point. I mean, I agree with everything you said. It's right. Okay, then I'll sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, George. Thanks for taking questions. What can we as individuals do to promote freedom? Well, I, I believe, I really do believe that uh, the blockchain is a major advance for individual liberty. It, uh, essentially, it reverses the current relationship between individuals and the big uh, internet companies and websites that, that currently dominate their lives. And it does it uh, by reversing uh, the, today, uh, you have to qualify to transact at any of the thousands of websites you may use. And you have to individually comply with the different terms of each one, different usernames, passwords, and you have to virtually strip yourself naked before the camera in order to uh, transact in some of these uh, arenas. And, and uh, essentially, you are, uh, uh, are qualified for them. 
with the blockchain system, you have your public-private key, and that's it. And all the websites and the uh, economy that want to uh, deal with you have to deal through your that system, and uh, they have to respect the immutable database of uh, the shared state of the whole system, uh, which the blockchain establishes. And so it, uh, today, the internet is a series of porous pyramids where all the money, data, and power rise to the top. And uh, what we really need, as one company uh, describes itself, is a block stack where uh, the internet where you, where the individual is, is, in, is in control. And that, that is really what the blockchain achieves. You know, you mentioned being almost naked before the camera, and I thought the technology already was they could see through your clothes anyway. So. <laughs> uh, second question, juxtapose the danger, if you would, for us of government overreach versus technology company uh, overreach and control into the individual life. I, I, I think that it's, and this is what I've been ranting and raving about at Freedom Fest for the last five days. So everybody's uh, is, uh, denouncing Facebook and Google and Apple and everybody for um, their monopolistic excesses and their invasions of privacy and their uh, abuse of data and all these uh, claims, and uh, I think what happened is the fundamental principle that made the internet possible and popular has been uh, violated. That fundamental principle was if you had a conduit, you were not responsible for the content that got transmitted across it. And what's happened is uh, conservatives, leftists, everybody have converged on the idea that somehow Facebook and Google and these uh, and Apple, all the companies that uh, run various c networks and conduits and social um, media are somehow responsible for fake news and hate speech and all these elusive and murky concepts that can't possibly be administered in a fair or, um, or persuasive way. So this is just a prescription for paranoia. If, you, if the government makes these co companies responsible, and then the companies have to create these filter algorithms that are always going to make mistakes more often than they do anything correctly. Uh, and, uh, and then they hire a bunch of college graduates to, to resolve disputes or whatever, and all coming out of the leftist academy. Uh, you just get a mess, and, uh, and that's what's happened. But, uh, but I don't think Facebook's a threat to freedom of speech. Facebook is a vast expansion of freedom of speech. It's, it's resulted in a big efflorescence of speech all across the world. Two billion posts a, a second or minute or whatever it is. I don't know. It's, uh, it, it just... It was started by libertarians. I mean, Peter Thiel is the real founder of Facebook. He took Zuckerberg from Harvard and stuck him out in Silicon Valley and gave him half a million bucks to create Facebook. And that's, that's how it, it essentially happened. And so I, I just think it's, a gover it's the government, it's a government problem. The government is requiring these companies to be responsible for uh, content and uh, they can't possibly perform the function in a sort of reasonable or persuasive way. So everybody, the left thinks Facebook elected Trump, the right thinks Facebook is suppressing Prager University. I, I don't know, it's, it just is, it's, 
it's a conspiracy theory, and like all other conspiracy theories, it's wrong. George, to close the loop, I am absolutely positive half the people in this room do not understand the blockchain. What would be your elevator explanation uh -huh. of the blockchain for everybody? Well, uh, th that's always... Uh, essentially what's happened is that in the past, if to uh, create a ledger or, or a, a record of all the transactions across an economy would be totally futile. I mean, it would just pile up vastly more uh, bytes than could possibly be uh, uh, compiled. So, so uh, uh, that means that uh, all sort of transactional systems had to be centralized, and they all are centralized as a result, because you um, that's the only way you can uh, get enough memory and disk drives and storage and, and manage it to uh, run a transaction system. Well, in recent years, uh, the memory technology has just advanced at a tremendous pace, faster than Moore's Law. And, and flash memory has been a tremendous success in solid state flash memory to the extent to the, uh, today you can have terabytes of, of memory in a smartphone. And all of a sudden, uh, a hashed record, a mathematical, mathematically compressed record of all the transactions across an economy becomes a manageable problem. A hash reduces a large body of uh, data to essentially a, a defined 36 bytes is what it is in the uh, blockchain. And so uh, vast quantities of data can be uh, don't have to be centralized where they can be hacked by opponent, by people who want to steal them, or they can be distributed all across the whole net. Everybody can have their total uh, ledger, and uh, and that means and and the ledgers can be reconciled by various techniques that have been, uh, that are controversial. Mining is one technique with proof of work. There's proof of stake, there's proof of this and that. But anyway, uh, the result is that blockchains, even though uh, uh, can allow the distribution all across the whole net of all the transactions, if they're dis distributed like that, nobody can steal them. You steal it in one place, and, and unless you steal half of all, unless you can uh, occupy half of all the nodes in the network and take control in, in a way that would be very conspicuous and, and uh, would result in all sorts of reactions, it, it means a database that essentially of, of shared state, of shared uh, consensual, consensual time-stamped transactions can be on every node in the network. And, and, and that means they can't be hacked. And Bitcoin, which has harbored billions and billions of dollars of value for most of the last 10 years, uh, has never been hacked. On the, the blockchain, its various exchanges have been hacked. And that's a further uh, challenge for the industry. But uh, that that's... Uh, and the cryptocurrencies that result from this, you were asking about the uh, individual, you know, the, how individual freedom could be restored. And uh, cryptocurrencies are like cash. People talk about them as being like cash. They, they allow a certain degree of anonymity in transactions. You don't, you don't have to um, uh, expose all your personal data to do a routine transaction, and that's why cash is widely used. 
the great advance of the cryptocurrencies is not anonymity, because ultimately the government can find, it, find you out if they, if they want to. Uh, uh, it's not anonymity. The, it is attestation. What, it, what uh, the blockchain allows is, is functional anonymity for transactions, but when a corporation comes to you and says they, you violated their contract or, or you've embezzled money from the bank or, you, or the government comes and says you have uh, avoided taxes or, or abused some other uh, sumptuary law, uh, the, you, can, you now have a way of establishing absolutely of the time-stamped record of what you actually did. And it's, it's this ability to, to, for individuals to produce unimpeachable records and facts uh, that, that can't be uh, uh, twisted or defrauded that is the great advance over cash and why cryptocurrencies, I think, will uh, usurp cash in the end. Thanks so much for so many insights, George. I uh, find it quite brilliant. Um, but my, I'm deeply embedded in the climate issue, as many of the people here are. I am too. And uh, my country, Canada, is being destroyed by this issue. Uh, Your what? Country of Canada. Oh, yeah. Well, the, uh, there's, there's what about the country of the United States? Yes, except, except uh, it's worse in what Canada. What about all our colleges? Yes, all of that. <laughs> Uh, that's why uh, Facebook, so what, is just gossip. Twitter is a great place to have discussion and debate if that's what you want to focus on. Yep. Uh, so, but Google is a special case. Well, Google and Wikipedia, I would say, because they're supposed to be where you can get information. And I've watched Google. I use it every day, many times. Yep. Uh, Wikipedia, not as often, but I use it a lot. Uh, and it's, it's the, the, the leftist agenda is continually creeping further up to the top to where now, when you look for me on there, for example, Desmog Blog is my first entry, which is definitely a hate site. The what? Desmog Blog. It's uh, been created in Vancouver by a guy who was the PR uh, agent for the Maharishi you, by the way? I'm Mahesh Yogi. Patrick Moore of... Uh, oh, you're Patrick Moore. I'm Patrick Moore. Oh, well, I'm great. one of, one of them. <laughs> Yes. I wanted to, <laughs> I missed your speech, but anyway. So, so what I'd like to, I, I believe it is dangerous that Google and Wikipedia are uh, writing, what, the, the, what they say they're writing algorithms which cause things to come to the surface, uh, which are, uh, and, and, and they have openly declared in Google that their objective is to oust Trump, uh, which means that they are, part of a rebellion of some kind, and they're a very powerful part of a rebellion because everybody's depending on them. And I, I think I agree with you that trying to make laws to change this is probably futile, but what can be done? Well, uh, I think what we're doing is, uh, I mean, we've, we won the climate change debate pretty much in the Trump administration. Not entirely, I understand, but, but we've effectively done as well as you do in politics on a, in a debate, and you, you guys won. Um, now, Google has, uh, I've studied their algorithms. Uh, PageRank is a fas fascinating system, and the way it works is, is very routine. It assigns to the most connected sites the greatest weight in the uh, evaluation of responses to a search query. And uh, this means that uh, Google's results reflect the dominance of the mass media by the left. I mean, if you have the, le we're, we are constantly declaiming the complete dominance of the universities and the mass media by the left. And then when Google's neutral, it is neutral, search engine delivers 
leftist responses to the most sort of public, politically controversial matters. Most of Google doesn't seem to me to be particularly biased. I don't think it is as good as the world's leading center of artificial intelligence should be. I, I, I don't think they've improved their, their search capabilities as much as I would have anticipated by now. So I think they're probably vulnerable to new search technologies, and there's quite a few that are emerging, and you, you should try them and use them. And for browsers, I think the Brave browser is a great venture by Brendan Eich, and I suggest all of you use the Brave browser. I, I, you probably don't want to throw away Chrome when you do it, because the fact is the Internet is so widely dominated by various Google operations, which are functionally quite brilliant in many cases. Yep. And if you use the Brave browser, you find yourself running awry of some of the more obscure rules of the Google world. And so it's not as efficient for some things as the old browsers, but it's a great, it's faster for uh, stuff that's slowed by advertising. B-R-A-V-E. It's a browser created by Brendan Eich, who uh, did the Netscape browser, was part of the Netscape team. He brought in Secure Sockets layer to uh, Netscape. He, he brought in, uh, he invented the JavaScript language, which is now the most widely used computer language. Uh, he's, uh, he's a great guy. He, he got uh, thrown out of Mozilla uh, for giving a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or something to uh, uh, can, to the marriage, uh, Prop eight. what? Prop eight. Prop eight. Yeah. Thank you. You say stay the course. I think. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, want, I had a question and a comment. Question first of all about the IPOs. Is that, did you say that they are higher priced? adjusted for inflation than from, the, from some point in the past? Yes. And what was that exactly? Um, I mean, I've been through these numbers there. Uh, I think the uh, adjusted for inflation. Yeah. Uh, the they're, they're 10 times as much as they were at some point in the past? Yeah, 10 times. I, I, when okay. not adjusting for inflation, they're okay. about 10 times or more bigger. And and what, how uh, adjusted in for inflation, you? maybe it's five times. I don't know. Okay, well, uh, but, as but compared there, to... But in other words, when a company goes public, it has experienced know. a lot more yeah. of its total career Future earnings. of uh, value creation. Yeah. Okay. And thus, most of the... But, but uh, most what, of the gains the, accrue to the venture capitalists rather I'm, than to the... What I'm asking is, com as compared to how far back in the time, well, their, their historic ratios... Uh, going back to 19, um, 2000, uh, there's a 90% okay. okay. drop in IPOs, in the okay. number okay. of IPOs. Okay. And well, the average value, uh, the uh, value of the ones that, that still happen has gone uh, up. Way, way high. Yeah. Because compared to back then. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, uh, from my perspective, um, then I have something to say. Uh, that was my question because, okay. uh, well, let me, my question actually, that was a preface so I could ask the question correctly. Okay. Uh, the question is, do you think, what do you think of the view? Well, I have to tell you right now, I'm very bullish on the stock market and I have been all through this okay. since 2008. And uh, right now the stock market is dirt cheap in tech, it's dirt cheap, even though by historical standards it's high. The same thing was true in 1987, and for the same reasons. The same reasons, the way I look at it, which is through Austrian economics, so I won't yeah, go into detail, too. though. Yeah, okay, but there's ways and there's ways. I may ways. not look Austrian, but... <laughs> okay, no, but in any case, the stock market is dirt cheap right now. And that could change quickly, but it will only change after a significant... Cheap by what standard? We gotta, we don't by the... By the I'm, interest, I'm really by the, interested. By though. the nominal interest rates as opposed to and interest rates, real interest rates as adjusted for underlying long-term inflation as compared to uh, the uh, PE ratios or the earning ratios.
the, the so PE. The, oh, so, the, so, the PE so what you're really saying is it's, is it's cheap um, in relation to bonds. That's the, that's the proper okay, measure. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, that's one way to measure it. If you think bond prices are being manipulated yeah. drastically by central right. banks, that's then right. the cheapness of the stock market with relation to bonds yeah, yeah. might be a morbid indicator. Yes, but, um, but anyway, that's what I was saying. Maybe that's why the IPOs are so high, because they, uh, the market, you know, the market forces have a way of showing themselves in markets where things are freely traded. Yeah. And the price that's being put on IPOs may be higher because people anticipate uh, either a, uh, an inflation of, of capital goods prices in the future or uh, without even maybe realizing it, but just economic reality out there. The forces that are going on are reflecting that in the price of the IPOs. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that that, um, that the uh, market nominally is just expected to rise. Okay. Uh, uh, much uh, by, by very certain interesting questions, and we can discuss them later. Okay. Well, the comment I wanted to make is that those who fail to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Okay. And I think that's what's maybe an element of what's going on now uh, because. Thank you. Okay. Huh? I wanted to get his opinion. Well, okay, never mind. Thank you. Never mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. What? Great to All see right, you, yeah, Howard. Thank you. thank you for coming. And thank you, Mr. Gilder. Thank you very much.